Hey guys, Too Legit City here. Today we're going to be going over a build design in a game of Oxygen Not Included. Today we're going to be going over the Petroleum Boiler. Now if you guys didn't know, crude oil, as you can see right here, we have a large pool of it, becomes petroleum if you boil it to 400 degrees. Or you guys could use the oil refinery that gives you a 2 to 1 ratio in turnover where 10 kilograms becomes 5 kilograms of petroleum. Otherwise, if you want to have a 100% turnover rate, you're going to want to boil your crude oil manually. And today we're going to show you how to do just that with the magma core. Now to get things started, one of the things I recommend looking out first is actually looking at your magma core. Try to dig as close as you can without cracking into the bisolite. Hope that you don't have any natural openings. And then look at the size of your magma pools. Typically what you're looking for is a large pool of magma with the least amount of obsidian and if it's possible touching other pools of magma as well. As you can see, we chose this location as right here with the vacuum is going to be where our heat sink is going to stick in and touch the magma. And that's because this is the most attractive area as of right now. The next step is I would recommend vacuuming out the area that you want to build your boiler because it's going to be a geothermal heat based boiler you're gonna be wanting to vacuum this out before you do any of the abyssalite mining as if you have any of the gas mediums inside here or even liquids touching the abyssalite is going to superheat that if you have crude oil on the bottom it's going to flash into sour gas if you have any gases in here the gas contact to the abyssalite and touching the tiles on the side will melt it now you guys might also notice that my vacuum box right here is made at a regular tile that's because in the uh, petroleum boiler design that we're doing today we're gonna have the entire design sit in a vacuum for it to maintain its function so having insulated tiles here or not doesn't matter to me and for that case it's gonna be not necessary in my opinion if you guys do choose to put insulated tiles over here it doesn't matter it's gonna be up to you but in my case, we're just going to be using regular igneous rock tiles. The thickness of it doesn't matter as I was building out my layers of tiles and de deconstructing it afterwards to create my vacuum. That's just how I chose to do so. You guys could pump out the gas. You guys could do any method you guys want to do. Door crush it. That's going to be entirely up to you. But I do recommend having a vacuum in the beginning. Now, if you guys are wondering the size or dimensions of this, this is actually going to be dependent on what you're going to want to do, how many loops you're going to want to have in the design, and we'll go over that in the next step. All right, guys, so we are at the next step. Now, this is going to be the design. One of the things you guys are going to have is something called a counter flow. We'll go over that in a second. At the end, we're also going to be doing something called an infinite spill tank so that we could have a storage tank to store all of the petroleum, regardless of the amount. And this is going to be our heat sink design that we're going to be building. Now, I mentioned earlier that the size of this is going to be dependent on your build. That's going to be because if you guys don't have a lot of horizontal space and you guys have to build a little bit thinner, you guys would make up with that by building a little bit taller as you guys could make this spillway a little bit taller so that it could spill and loop a couple more times if your horizontal distance for your loops is not actually that long so you have a little bit of leeway depending on if you guys want to build this a little bit wider or taller but in all cases we'll tell you the things you guys are necessarily going to have or need in order for this to work well the setup right here is going to always go from the heat sink and go up vertically this is going to be where the boiling is going to happen and then the counter flow loops you could see that we have pipelines there that's because we're going to be having to cool down the hot 400 degree petroleum after it's boiled and we don't have pumps able to actually handle that temperature so instead what we're doing is we're having the petroleum spill out immediately after it's boiled and then having radiant piping come in contact with that spillway so that the oil we're pumping in could chill the petroleum as it's coming out. This has a double effect as that also heats up the crude oil allowing that to boil faster the moment it actually comes out of the liquid vent. That's actually why you have a counterflow design as so, as the counterflow is going to be the way you're going to chill your petroleum after it's boiled. That way your liquid pump at the end could be made out of steel and pump out all the petroleum you want to use. Now another thing we're going to talk about is the heat sink. 
Now the heatsink over here, what I recommend doing is building the automation cables first before building the door. That's because once you have the heatsink down here already touching the magma, you're going to want to not have that heat transfer its thermal energy. That means that the moment you're priming up the system up top, you don't accidentally flash the sour gas. And the trick for that is building the automation cable first before building your mechanized airlock. This mechanized airlock does have to be made out of steel. Now for the heatsink, the bottom part, what we did was corner build. We had tiles here, here, and here with uh, these two being abyssalite. And then we corner built this tile mined out this tile to build out these two and then we stood on this tile to mine this out and then build out the tile there after we build these four tiles we could safely just build anything else we just put another two tiles there the size of the bottom of the heatsink does not matter you guys could just have two tiles within the door setup if if that's what you guys want but in most cases this is not gonna matter at all now this part does matter above the door where do you have the door at when you build it you want to have the signal switch set to green so that it stays open so that the moment you do build the mechanized airlock it does not take any of the heat away from the bottom window tiles of course i don't know if i said that earlier but these window tiles i recommend being diamond as diamond does not melt and if you guys don't have diamond you guys could use steel metal tiles as the metal tiles and the steel, it's going to be good enough to not melt immediately in the 16, 1700 degree magma that we have down here at the magma core. Now, the heat sink up top, it's actually recommended that you have at least six tiles like this. Or, well, it's three tiles, but because I'm running a too thick heat sink, it's going to be six tiles. The reason behind that, we'll show you later in the priming process, but just believe me, you can want this to be at least three layers or six tiles in my case and if you guys want it longer than that that's fine just do not have it be shorter this segment right here if it's too short from the door you're going to be transferring in a thousand degree heat and it's going to basically transfer all that to this tile immediately meaning the heat transfer from this tile to the door it's going to be the fastest the other layers behind it it's going to transfer from this tile to this tile and then this tile to this tile it's going to be a little bit slower and we'll show you the heat distribution later on this is to prevent the accidental flashing of sour gas the moment the door closes because if you have only one thin layer of window tile here it's going to immediately jump up to a thousand degrees and you're going to have no chance of having that flash into petroleum and not into sour gas now if you guys didn't know sour gas is what happens if you overboil the petroleum if you guys didn't know petroleum becomes sour gas at 538 degrees meaning that if we hit 540 it's going to flash into sour gas. So we have to make sure that we don't do that as that immediately breaks the build. And if you guys run into that issue, I recommend saving before attempting anything with the hot magma as the sour gas is going to be a pain to deal with. It's going to be super hot, which means your pumps are going to break when trying to pump it out. And then it's going to be a mess. Now, another tip is when you guys are mining out the heat sink to do the uh, design down here, if you guys do decide to sweep out the hot abyssalite or obsidian that may be in the way, understand that you guys are going to run into this problem. Them carrying the hot debris while moving over oil flashes the oil into sour gas. This is the problem that I just talked about. So the biggest tip is save before doing that because while your dupes carry out the debris, the temperature is active on the material meaning that them passing through the liquid lock may accidentally flash the crude oil and ruin the vacuum so i highly recommend saving if you guys do decide to sweep out the hot material that's in here because if you guys don't do this now your duplicates may if you guys do need to build obsidian tiles or use abyssal line for making insulation material they might walk in here to grab it and then accidentally break the liquid lock here to let the other gases in and completely destroying the system later on of course that's just a what if scenario of the worst that can happen now the other parts of the design i recommend not having any tiles touching the four directions 
So north, south, east, west of this tile or this tile. So there's no tile here, 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 and here. That's because of how heat transfer works from solid to solid. If we had a airflow tile touch this tile, the heat immediately goes to the airflow tiles and potentially melts the material. And that means that we lose a lot of thermal energy as the airflow tiles are gonna heat up each other and that's going to suck away a lot of the energy from the heat sink. You don't want that as you want this to last longer. Now, this part of the design right here, this is the boiling shaft where you're going to drop off your crude oil. As you see, that's where the liquid vent is. The thing about this is that you could build this as tall as you want. The idea, though, is that there is going to be a liquid here that's already around 400 degrees and it's just you making more of the resource pushes up the existing liquid up so it spills over on the spillway. You actually can't have this taller than 30 tiles. Around 30 tiles, the petroleum stacks up so that the liquid vent overpressurizes over a thousand kilograms and cannot release any more liquid. Crude oil also overpressurizes this if the spillway is above 16 tiles that tall and that's because again it's going to overpressure the vent not allowing any of the resources to come out the crude oil doesn't really matter as that's only when you're priming up the system once this is running in full bloom every liquid in this container outside of this tile is going to be petroleum and in that case petroleum is usually going to be what limits us for our design now another thing is the automation is pretty simple we want a simple wire from the door to the vent to a thermal sensor. This thermal sensor is going to be set to above 400 for the priming process. After it's running in full bloom, we'll set this to 402. But in the beginning, leave it at 400 and hit the above. Send green signal if above 400 degrees Celsius. Now, if you guys are worried with the signal switch interrupting the build, the signal switch can't hurt this if it's on red, but we will only turn the switch off once we're ready to kick up the design to start it up. So this is going to be your kickstart button. Having it on green means that you're still building, still waiting for your design to finish, whether it's going to be power wires for the pump, pipeline for the counter flow, setting up the heat sink or the airflow tiles. Depending on what you're still building, you want this on green if you're still trying to complete the design. But once you're ready to have this start, uh, I would tell you the steps on how to kickstart this, but otherwise leave it on green. All right, guys, we're at the next step, and the next step is going to be the priming process. Before we can actually have this run in full force, we need to do something called priming. Priming is setting up the design so that it could run at full force, but usually there's a couple of intricacies with this so that you don't accidentally get the wrong result or a bad result. This is going to be the priming process we're going to be going over. So to get it started, of course, what you're going to need is also a... Uh, source of crude oil i had a lot of crude oil at the bottom of my map you guys may have to tap into an oil reservoir if you guys don't have crude oil uh, waiting to be pumped in but you do need a good amount before boiling it now to get the boiling process started i would recommend a couple of tons if not around 10 to 20 tons of crude oil as you may need to wait a long time for the par uh, priming process to work well. But to get it started, one of the things you're going to need to do is fill up your shaft right here that you're going to be boiling at with crude oil. You guys could choose to pump it in via the pipeline, or you guys could just put a bottle amp here to get it started. But you want to have at least half of the tiles, at least half. And you don't want to fill it up so that the crude oil spills on the spillway. Looking at the liquid overlay, we have no liquids on this, but ideally, you're going to want it to be at the halfway mark with the amount of crude oil you have in your shaft. Now, once you have enough crude oil here, before you actually kickstart the priming process by hitting the signal switch, I recommend doing one thing before doing that, and that is having your pump be active the moment you kick it on. You're gonna need some crude oil in the pipelines right here so that you could cool down the petroleum once it starts boiling and you need to be able to add in some 
cool crude oil so that you could even out the priming process of all the liquids inside this area. So we're going to pause, have this close because it's going to be ready. And then on this side, we're going to attach the power line. This is still to above 400 so that we don't accidentally get close to the 500 degrees. So by closing that, there is going to be heat transfer from the bottom to here. Immediately, you can see that it spikes up. And if I were to pause, this is 311, this is 215, this is 154. There's a little bit of a delay for the heat transfer, and we need that delay because we don't want this accidentally getting to a higher temp, which is why I recommend at least three tiles if you guys are using a one tile boiler. But if you guys are using the two like I am, you guys, I would recommend having a three layer setup here at minimal. More is okay, less is not good. Now we're going to put this on 3x speed and we're going to be looking at the liquid overlay to see the petroleum once it's ready and then we're going to look at the thermal sensor right here to look at the temperature of the liquid. The moment this actually happens, what we're going to see is a yellow blob start coming up and floating to the top. Petroleum naturally is lighter than crude oil and because of that it's going to always float to the top which is why we had the liquid pipeline spawn the crude oil at the bottom closer to the heatsink. Another thing about this is that both petroleum and crude oil have less volume per tile for each of the liquid. That means that if you guys didn't know, petroleum is around 740 kilograms per tile before it starts a new tile above it. And for crude oil it is around 870 kilograms. That lower volume per tile mass for the liquids, it's actually beneficial as it allows us to do this trick with the crude oil vent or the liquid vent right here with the crude oil in it. So because of that, we easily could use this design to make it so that we boil something, which pushes something up top, to allow us to use the counterflow design to cool things out. One of the things we will want to look for is on these two top tiles. It will get close to 500 degrees Celsius. And if it gets over 520, you have a switch right here that you could manually open up the door, preventing any more heat transfer from happening and then also add in some cool crude oil. That's gonna mean that you're not going to flash into sour gas. All right, so we're starting to get a little bit of petroleum to flash and a little bit of the crude oil is starting to dance as you can see. This is where we really wanna pay attention to these two tiles. If these two tiles, when this starts happening, starts to become close to 500 degrees, this is where we could accidentally flash into sour gas. Because of the liquids dancing, the amount of crude oil actually touching the surface after the petroleum floats to the top actually gets very finicky. It could be as little as 5 kilograms, meaning that it would immediately flash upon touching the window tile. So you have to watch out. Now the thing is, is that you can see that it doesn't spike up very absurdly on the window tiles. So you could very easily monitor this until the entire stack becomes petroleum. Now you can see a little bit of the petroleum is spilling off, which is part of the design. And so that's going to be a good thing. But what we're going to want to do is flash the entire thing and make sure this does not get close. You can see that it's still climbing. That's because we haven't added in any new crude oil yet to take over the old crude oil and because of that we don't have a lot of cooling inside so all we could do is absorb the heat but you could see that it's steadily climbing up once it starts getting around 500 degrees you may start to wonder if you should slow down the simulation speed and i do recommend that so hovering over these two tiles, you can see that our thermal sensor is still only at 380, 390 degrees, not at 5 or 490, where the actual window tile temperature is at. And this is going to be the scariest part of the design, the priming process. You can see that we've reached 500 a couple times, very steadily, 505, 504, and it seems to be okay. See, 520, if that ever happens, we may want to slow down. I'm going to slow down to 2x speed here. And we're getting close. We're getting close. 
this is the fine line that you kind of have to straddle in order to be uh, able to get this. And now we have the 400 degree for the first time. Open and close, open and close. That's because 400 is not the correct temperature. And let's look at the crude oil. So you can see 401, it has not become crude or the crude oil has not become petroleum yet at 401, even though it's 399.9. That's because you have two degrees in state change. At this point, we push this up to 402. 402 is the actual temperature the crude oil has to be at for it to become petroleum. So now we should be okay to set it to 402, but we still have to put this on 1x speed and pay attention to these window tiles. So it's opening and closing, opening and closing at 402. Once we see the crude oil all flash into petroleum, we're going to be completely good. And we are there. There we go. And now we are done. This is the priming process. Now, if you look at the liquids, we could have petroleum spilling over. Now, let's go over the counterflow design right here. Now that we see it in action, if we actually bring up the heat overlay, you can see that very easily. The last layer is actually very cool compared to the first two levels. Actually looking at the liquids, this is around 355 degrees. This is around 200 degrees, goes down to as close as almost the lowest 100. This is at 111. And then over here at the bottom, starts at 100, stops at 70. That's because our crude oil com uh, comes in at 80 degrees Celsius pretty steadily. And because of that, the crude oil becomes petroleum and it's at 400 degrees. It starts to spill, which runs into the counterflow design, which cools it and primes up the crude oil so that the moment it comes out of the vent, it immediately becomes petroleum. And then we cool it at the same time. For the shaft segment, I recommend using insulated properties. Uh, of course, igneous, if you guys have it. If you guys don't have igneous and have other minerals, just make sure that it doesn't melt if you guys have one of the other types. I don't think there's a mineral that actually melts this low. For the most case, the insulated properties are what you're looking for. Afterwards, you don't have to use a regular pipe. I like to have a smooth transition. Uh, after you get off of the shaft and you start going horizontal, a regular pipeline is recommended as it doesn't have as fast of a heat transfer as the radiant piping does. So this means that it slows down the heat transfer. You don't want this to get to 400 degrees. You want it to get close because you don't want it to break the pipes. Uh, if you guys didn't know, even though petroleum's in a liquid, if crude oil boils in the pipelines and becomes petroleum, your pipes break. The state change is what kills it. So after that, we have a line of radiant piping. It's very straightforward what the radiant piping is doing. We're exchanging the temperature of the crude oil inside with the petroleum on the outside, and it's cooling it down. As you can see, it works pretty well. End temperature of 75 degrees. Now, this is the priming process. If you guys are going to be confident in your ability to consume all the petroleum as soon as it's pumped in you guys don't need the next step which is going to be the infinite spill design if you guys run out of crude oil and the pump empties the door actually opens and you shouldn't be able to flash it into sour gas anymore after the priming process is complete so if you run out of crude oil you're fine the only thing you guys may run into is if you get another liquid in the pipelines if you guys were using the oil reservoir and you guys had to use a oil well they may be times that you release water because it superheats in the pipelines and breaks and that gets into the oil and mixes in and if you pump that up you're gonna get steam in here you guys need to maintain the vacuum in here. So I would recommend filtering out before feeding into this pipeline with a proper filter so that you don't chance anything. And the next step of this part is going to be this part of the design. After your counterflow, depending on how long this is, how many layers you have, it doesn't really matter. You guys could have this be as tall as you want, as thin as you want. We talked about this earlier. So this part doesn't matter, but at the end of your counterflow, you're going to have to store your petroleum. You guys don't want your counterflow to be filled with petroleum, but you can have it stay there if you guys don't have the storage for it. 
Now, I do recommend the infinite spill as it means that you don't have to worry or think about storage for the petroleum. So in your counterflow design, what you're going to have to do is add two doors at the edge of your spillway, one up to the left of that, as you can see, one here, one here. And then what you're going to want to do is have your insulated tile right here. Now, depending on how your design and your box works, you guys don't need a copy of the design, but we could talk about how this works. Basically, we want to pump from the bottom. We are using these tiles here to create two gas tiles here that's going to be able to stand. And what we're going to want to have as well is a way to walk inside in case something happens. We're going to make a liquid lock right here with crude oil, all made out of airflow tiles. And we put two airflow tiles here so that this tile does not break from liquid pressure. Now, another thing about the design is you have to already be making petroleum already for this to work. And that's because these liquid tiles have to be filled. This layer at the bottom and the layer that's spilling in. You need to have these two segments of petroleum already there. And you cannot be pumping out petroleum while this is happening. So I would recommend not actually having the pump built, or if you do have it built, don't plug it in as you don't want this to accidentally break because if one gas bubble breaks out, it's going to fill up the entire room, touch the heatsink, and then flash everything to sour gas, and that's going to be a bad time. What I would recommend next is building a gas vent here and then building out a pipeline to move in some gases in once you are ready. All right, so we have the vent here. I pumped out two gases and we used the bridge to bring the gases here. As you can see, we have a tile of chlorine inside the pipeline and a tile of carbon dioxide. This is, you could very easily just deconstruct the pipeline until you get two in a sequence and then deconstruct all the pipelines afterwards so that you only send two packets. Then what you're going to want to do is have this ready and we'll show you because all we have to do now is to connect that. So the two gases are coming in. I'm not going to pay attention to that. Just going to reiterate the liquids have to be on this level and this level for this to work well. Now, once we get that in, we'll have our two gases. And then bring up the gas overlay. As you can see, chlorine CO2. This is never going to move. This is going to be how we create the infinite spillway. And make sure you lock your doors. If you don't, your dupes could walk in, break the uh, gas lock, and then ruin your build. All right, so now it's been running for a while. We deconstructed the uh, pipeline. I need to deconstruct the uh, gas vent still. As you can see, we still have the gas lock in here. And the uh, crude oil is now pressurized. We have around 800 kilograms here. It's filled up the tank. And even though this is at seven, 800 kilograms, the crude oil is not budging. And that's because petroleum can never push downwards on a crude oil lock. So if you guys build a liquid lock like this design, the petroleum will never be able to push down on it unless it is a memory leak. But that has been how to build a petroleum boiler using the geothermal energy at the magma core at the bottom of your map. If you guys have any questions about the design, anything you guys are not familiar with or have problems with, leave a comment down below. Hope you guys enjoyed today's video. And of course, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, guys.